Okay? So the bait of non including hash is 0 0.688. Because cash is not risky. Cash has a beta of 0. Okay? Does our cash go down? Does cash <coughs> okay? No. No, it doesn't. It's, it will still be there, right? So it, it doesn't go down, so it has a beta of 0. So just this line at the end, we could just forget this line if you want. But this is just, if we want, we can change this number to the beta without cash. Just if we want, but we don't have to do that, okay? We, we didn't do that for the question. We just stopped here at 2a, okay? Another question I had was about this box again, uh, which was <coughs> about investing. The last question, investing in, dis in the movie industry. Studio <coughs> entertainment is another word for movie. Studio entertainment or movie industry, it's another word, okay? It's the same thing. So, uh, <coughs> we just, if I come to you and you are a financial manager for Disney movie section, right? You have to know this number. <coughs> this number tells you the risk of investing in a movie in Disney, okay? The risk in the industry is 1.3 is the beta for the unlevered beta for the industry. We have 45% debt in our company. So our unlevered beta our levered beta will be 1.6. We put this into our CAPM equation. We're going to get 13.5%. Now I need to know that. That's the risk of investing in a movie. So somebody comes to me and tells me they can make a profit of 12%. Where did they get that number from? We didn't study yet. We're going to study in the next part of the course. This is expected return, okay? This is estimating the profit we're going to make. Okay, that's the next part of the course is to study this, how to get this number, right? But for the moment, I'm just interested. They come to me and they say, we expect to make a profit of 12%. But I'm working in this department. I'm going to tell them, I'm sorry, I can't invest in that project, okay? The hurdle rate that we need to get over in order to invest in any project in this department is 13.5%. And then they'll say to me, oh, but Disney's cost of equity is just 8.9%, okay? And then I'll say to them, no, you have to think about the specific department because if somebody in the toy industry tells me they can make a profit of 15%, that's different than the movie industry. Movie industry has higher risk, okay? So if somebody comes to you from the toy industry and says, I can make a profit of 15%, or somebody comes from the movie industry and says, I can make a profit of 15%, who are you going to give the money to? Sorry. Toy industry, why? Lower risk. Lower risk, okay? So we have to think about that when we're deciding whether to give the money for projects or not. We have to know in our department, in our business sector, what is the risk? What is the hurdle rate? Okay? And then we use that to decide whether to take a project or not. Chris? <coughs> yes? You were saying that cash has no risk, no beta, but why is it so important to put zero there? Uh, we don't have to do that, I said. That's just a side point. Just if you want to. But is there any way for us to increase more than zero? Hash? No. No, never, right? No, no, no. Hash is just the same. Zero beta. So, uh, let's have a look at uh, another company's bottom up beta. So, the next company we're going to look at is Ara Cruz. It's a Brazilian paper and pulp company. Do you understand pulp? What is pulp? You cut down the tree, you cut up the tree, you have some pulp. It's not paper yet. <coughs> some kind of liquidy material. Liquidy material that white that you make into paper, right? So uh, we are going to find the uh, here we have, Brazil is an emerging market, so we have 46 paper and pulp companies in emerging markets. Like Russia, I guess you have a lot of paper and pulp companies, right? You have a lot of wood. Like India, or another emerging market country, right? 
We have 13 paper or pub companies in the US and 111 in the world. So we can get we get the average beta for each of these, right? And the average debt to equity. So we notice that the US companies have a lot more debt than the emerging market or the global paper and pub companies. Okay? And then we can get the unlevered beta here. If we want, we can correct it for cash. This is corrected for cash. We don't have to do that. That's just something extra if we want. Okay? So we can see it hardly makes much difference. 1 to 1 1.01, 75 to 77, 86 to 87. So correcting for cash is not, not uh, <coughs> essential, right? So we're going to use the beta for emerging market paper and pulp companies. 1.01. Why? Arab Cruz is in Brazil. It's an emerging market company. Okay? So the best one to compare it with is the, all the emerging market companies. So we get this unlevered beta. Okay? We can do the one corrected for cash. We're going to use this one, 1.01. What's our next step? We know our unlevered beta. How can we find the risk for, for uh, the levered beta? What do we need to, to know? We know our unlevered beta. We want to find our levered beta. What information do we need to know? Deck to equity ratio, right? The key information from changing levered to unlevered or unlevered to levered is? Debt to equity ratio. Okay, how much debt does our company have? So if we have high debt, debt to equity ratio will be higher. Our beta is going to be higher. If we have low debt, Debt to equity ratio is low, our beta is going to be lower. So we need to look at the debt. We find that they have 9.8 million Brazilian real in debt. They have 8907 no, uh, million in equity. Okay? So debt over equity is going to be 9.805 over 8907. It's 110%. Does this company have a lot of debt or not? Yes, right? We looked even higher than the average for the US. The average in the US was 92. The average for other emerging market companies was just 4%. They have a lot of debt. Does that mean that company is going to be more risky or less risky? So we have to have some equation where we can add this to the unlevered beta to show that it's going to be more risky. Okay? So the levered beta is going to be 1.01, the unlevered beta, times 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate, this is the tax rate in Brazil, 34%, times our debt to equity ratio, 1.1, 110% .1. is 1.1. So our lever beta will be 1.74 for our crews. Then we know our beta, we want to make our cost of equity, right? We need to know our risk free rate, our risk premium, and our beta. We can calculate the cost of equity. So we'll use the risk premium of 9.95%. Earlier in the course, we talked about finding the <coughs> risk-free rate and the risk premium, okay? We already calculated the risk premium for Brazil, okay? So this is composed of the equity risk premium in the US, 6%, plus Brazil's country risk premium of 3.9%, right? That's our risk premium, 9.95%. So cost of equity, it's going to be the 10-year ten, ten bond rate plus beta times the risk premium. So if we do it in US dollars, it's going to be 3.5% US dollar 10-year rate plus beta times the uh, risk premium, 20%. Okay? So this paper company is a risky company. We need to make more, if we want to invest in that company, we expect to make, that they make more than 20% profit a year. Okay, if this, you think this company will make 10% profit next year, are you going to invest in that company? No. No, right? <coughs> it needs to make more higher profit for you, because it's riskier. If we want, we can change to real. This is in US dollars. Okay, we can also do it in real. So, uh, <coughs> if we did it in real, this number will be higher, because it's not the US dollar, it's the Brazilian government bond. Okay? Inflation will be included, and it's going to be up to 26%. So, it depends 
we can do our, we need a, to make more than profit of 20% in US dollars, or we need to make profit of more than 27% in Brazilian real, the local currency. Okay? So the next company is Tata Chemical. Okay? So Tata Chemical, again, we're going, it's Indian company. We're going to compare it to other emerging market companies in this area. So they have two businesses, fertilizers and chemicals. Do you understand chemicals? Do you understand fertilizer? The farmer puts a fertilizer on the land to make the crops grow well. Okay? So there are two different businesses that Tata Chemicals does. Okay? Uh, we find uh, the unlevered beta. We found the unlevered beta for fertilizers was 0 0.72. Right? The average from other companies. Unlevered beta for chemicals, 0 0.68. Debt to equity ratio in Tata Chemicals, <coughs> it's the same. They have the same debt, 51%. So we find our levered beta. Okay? If we know our unlevered beta and debt to equity ratio and tax rate, put them into the equation, find our levered beta. Then after we have our levered beta, <coughs> find our cost of equity. This time in Indian rupee. Indian rupee risk free rate is 4%. Indian uh, risk premium is going to be 6 plus 4 is going to be 10%. Okay? And then we, we are going to have 4 plus the beta times the 10%. So 13.9% total for the company, 13.5% for chemicals, and 14% for fertilizers, okay? So we need to make more than 13% profit in Indian rupee before we invest in this company, Tata Chemicals. Next company, Deutsche Bank, German bank. Deutsche Bank has two businesses, commercial banking and investment banking. What is the difference between commercial banking and investment banking? Which one is riskier? Investment banking is riskier, yes. Why? They can, lose money. they can lose money more, right? Commercial banking is getting a getting a deposit from you. Do you understand deposit? How do you say deposit in Korean? Yegum. Hmm? So you deposit money in my bank and I give you a loan. Yegum Decho. This is commercial banking. Okay? That is safer than investment banking. Investment banking you give me Gago, instead of giving a loan to her, I invest the money in stocks or something else, right? It's a riskier, riskier business. I can invest my client's money. That's investment banking. We saw that a lot of the big owners in the stock companies are investment banks, right? Investment banks make funds and they can invest the money in funds and so on, right? So investment banking is riskier. We can see here the beta for investment banking is 1.37. Commercial banking is 1.05. So where did we get these numbers from? For commercial banking, we use the average beta of European commercial banks. Okay? To estimate the investment banking, we use all the investment banks in the world. Most investment banks are based in the US and the UK. Big investment banks. So top five. Four of them are from the US, like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, okay, so on. So, this Deutsche Bank's investment banking is global. They invest all over the world, right? So we use the global banks to compare. Their commercial banking is local. They just take deposits from German people, not from US people. And they give loans to German people, mainly, right? So commercial banking, we just use the European banks. Okay, how many? Banks did we get at 90? Got the average, 1.05. Investment banks, 32, 1.37. Lehman Brothers was a famous investment bank which went bankrupt during the Wall Street, right? So that's going to make this beta higher. An investment bank went bankrupt, it's riskier. So the total beta is going to be 1.162. We have to put in the weights. This is 65% of their business. This is 35% of their business. So, uh, we're going to estimate their cost of equity in euros. We use the German 
10-year bond rate of 3.6% as the risk-free rate, and 6% the same as the US. Germany has the same risk premium as the US. So commercial banking, cost of equity, 9.9%. Investment banking, 11.8%. Average, 10.5% for Deutsche Bank. So can you, see, can you see where we're getting the bottom-up beta from? Step one, find the average. The average beta for that industry, for that product, okay? Then, uh, find out how much of that is that in my company. Okay, then we add on the debt to equity ratio. And uh, in, in the banking area, we didn't use the debt to equity ratio because most banks have the same amount of debt. Banks have very high debt compared to equity. That was one of the problems in the financial crisis. Okay? One of the reasons is people expect the government to save the bank. If the bank goes bankrupt, they expect the government to step in and save the bank. Okay? So what happens is the banks can take on more debt and more debt and more debt. So they, they take on a lot of debt. So when we are comparing the banks, we are not using the debt here. Because governments can step in and save the bank. So uh, what about non-traded assets? So we were talking about public companies. Deutsche Bank is one of the biggest banks in the world, right? Tata Chemicals, Disney. What about a small company like a restaurant or a cafe? How can they calculate their beta? Okay? We can do... Uh, there's no stock prices to make the regression on Bloomberg service, right? Yahoo Finance doesn't have a beta for that company. It's just a small company. Okay? So first of all, we can compare them to, to comparable public firms. Secondly, we can use their accounting earnings to make a regression beta. So we are going to make a beta for a bookstore. Let's say you're running, you make your own bookstore, right? You want to know what your beta is. So first of all, we're going to find all the publishing and bookstore companies. We're going to get their beta. Average beta is 1.2. We're going to find their average debt to equity ratio, 53.47, right? So these are publicly traded companies, companies which sell stocks, and we can get this information publicly, okay? So we take away the debt to equity ratio, our unlevered beta will be 0 0.94. So this is our unlevered beta for the book industry. Okay, then we can, we can also correct for cash, and we can get uh, 1.02. <coughs> so we, we can look at Bookscape, and uh, we can try to calculate Bookscape's uh, debt to equity ratio, but if that's not available, in this case it's a private company, they don't want to tell us, right? They don't have to tell us. So we're going to assume it's, it's the same as the industry, 53.47%. We should try and find it out. So then we find their uh, levered beta using this debt to equity ratio and unlevered beta. It's 1.35. So we put our 1.35 into the equation and we get the cost of equity for a bookstore, which is 11.6%. So, the other way we can do this, is we can do a regression. We can compare the profit of Bookscape, the change in the revenue of Bookscape, against the change in the revenue of the S&P 500. So we can do it, make our own regression. Instead of the change in the stock price, change in the revenue, or change in the profit for the company. Okay? Then we can do kind of make our own regression, which, as I said, is complicated. You need a computer program to do that. So if we use this, the regression beta is 0 0.82. So we looked at uh, the S&P is going up, Bookscape is going up. S&P is going down, Bookscape's profit was also going down. The economy was bad, people weren't buying books, right? So it has a positive it has a positive regression relationship of 0.8. So in this case, our regression beta is 0.82. Then 
we can get 8.42%. So now we have two different numbers, a regression beta and a bottom-up beta. Just like with Disney, we had regression beta, beta and bottom-up beta. Okay? So this is a group question. So beta measures the risk added on to the diversified portfolio. The owners of your private bookstore are not diversified. You just decided to set up a bookstore. But you don't own any stocks, you don't own any other investments. So you are not a diversified investor, okay? You're only investing in this bookstore. All your money is invested in the bookstore. So do you think that using beta to arrive at the cost of equity for a private firm will underestimate the cost of equity, overestimate the cost of equity, or could under or overestimate the cost of equity? So basically, do you think it's okay to use beta here for a private firm. Because we said beta, we're using beta because we assume the uh, investor is already diversified, right? But now you're just investing in the book shop. Do you think beta is a good way? Or it could overestimate or underestimate your cost of equity? So discuss with your partner. Is beta a good measure of risk for you? An undiversified investor in a bookstore? Okay, so if you can remember at the start, we said that with beta, we're assuming that our investor is buying and selling assets, right, all the time. They're trading assets, okay? We assume that they already diversified this risk, firm risk. They already diversified competition risk, entire sector risk, exchange rate and political risk. They already diversified all these things. So they're concerned about the market risk, right? Only. Okay, if you are running a bookstore, are we including only the market risk or are we including all of these risks too? Okay, so hands up who says the bookstore owner only has to think about this market risk or hands up. Okay, who says the bookstore owner has to think about all of these risks? Hands up. Okay, let's try again. Everybody should put up their, their hand, right? You're running a bookstore by yourself. You're not invested anywhere else. You live in Korea, okay? Does the bookstore owner have to worry about just market risk 
or all of these risks? Okay, so hands up who says just market risk? Hands up who says all of the risks? Okay, so the answer is all of the risks, okay? She has to worry about competition risk. What happens if she opens a bookstore and Kyobo Bookstore opens up right next door? Is that risky? Yes. Does a diversified investor have to worry about that risk? No, they invested in different sectors, in different companies, in different countries, okay? But you have to worry about that risk. What about the entire sector? The entire book sector. People stop buying books. They just buy e-readers. They don't go to bookshops anymore. Is the diversified investor affected? No. No. Are you affected? Yes, definitely. People aren't going to shop in your bookstore. You're going to make less profit. Okay? What about exchange rate and political risk? North Korea starts a war with South Korea. Is the diversified investor protected? No, who said no? Hmm? They invested in the US, they invested in Europe, in South America, in other places. Yes, they're protected, right? They lose money, but not as much. Are you protected? No, your store value is going to go down, right? So that's the difference for the private business. They are thinking about all of these kinds of risks, okay? Compared to the diversified investor. So, the investor in your company is not a diversified investor, it's you, and you are not a diversified investor, right? What about the public company, like uh, Kyobo? Is Kyobo a public company? I, I don't know, right? But stockholders who buy stocks in Kyobo, is, uh, they are diversified, okay? So who is it going to cost more to get money? You or Kyobo? For who is the cost of money going to be more expensive? You or Kyobo? Who is it going to cost more to get money? Which do people prefer to invest in, Kyobo or your store? So it's going to be cheaper for Kyobo to get money, right? So that's one of the reasons why it's hard for the small private business to compete with the bigger business, right? Because the investors in the big public business they're already diversified investors. So they already diversified away this risk. Okay? But the investor in your just a single company, private investor, has not diversified those types of risk. So they have a higher risk. So let's look at the effect of this on the cost of equity. Just the last uh, couple of slides about uh, risk. So, <coughs> we are going to adjust the beta to reflect total risk rather than just market risk. Okay? This adjustment is pretty simple. Since the R squared of the regression measures the proportion of the risk that is market risk. We go back to the R squared. We could say how much is diversifiable or non-diversifiable risk. Okay? So total, total beta equals the market beta over the R squared. Correlation of that sector with the market. So we're going to put the mar market beta over the square root of the R squared. We'll just use this equation. We find that the average R squared of these uh, publicly traded firms is 21.58%, 0.2. And the correlation, then if we get the square root of this, it's going to be 0.46. So the total cost of equity is going to change 20.9%. Okay. So this is the last slide about beta. So we can see the difference here. If you are a diversified investor, we'll use this cost of equity, 11%. Okay? But if you're not a diversified investor, then it's going to change to 20%. We need to include all the other types of risk, which is usually diversified. Okay? So do you have any questions about uh, this? We can see why it's difficult for some small grocery store to compete with E-Mart or Lobby Mart, right? If we look, if 
we look at this uh, equation, okay, the small grocery store is not investor is not diversified. The investors in EMART are diversified, right? Therefore, uh, the risk is higher for the uh, non-diversified investors. Okay. <coughs> So then, uh, let's, do you have any questions about this last part? Just we looked at some more examples of calculating the bottom of beta. <coughs> and looked at how to do that for a private firm. Do you think you could calculate the bottom of beta for a company? Hmm? Okay, uh, so then let's uh, start the review. So I put the review, it's just some questions uh, for the midterm exam. Uh, it's on the Geishi Pan, not on the website, it's on the Geishi Pan. You know the Geishi Pan? Yeah. Just we are going to study the last 15 minutes today and the next class. Just practice answering some questions together with our group, right? Yes. And uh, then on Friday we have the exam. Okay, the exam is Short question, multiple choice question, and calculations. Okay? So, you should know how, to, you should be able to do the calculations. You're allowed to bring your notes to the test, right? You should also bring a calculator to the test. It's an open book exam, so you can use your phone, but it's quicker to use a calculator. Okay? Easier to use a calculator. So, if you have a calculator, you take the calculator. You don't need to learn the equations because you have the equations written in your book, okay? Just you should be able to do. You should be able to put the correct number in the correct place and do the calculations, okay? Last two years exam, the weakest point of the students was the calculations, okay? They lost a lot of marks because some students did first the multiple choice, then next the short questions, and then they left the calculation to the end. Maybe they didn't have enough time or else they didn't study the calculations well enough before the exam, okay? So if you can't, if some students just left the calculation part blank, they didn't try any calculation. Those students usually got the F grade at the end of the semester, okay? So just forgetting about the calculation is not good enough. You can't pass financial management course by just, oh, forget about the calculations. I can't do calculations, right? That's fine. But you can't pass a financial management course if you can't do any calculations, okay? I can't give you a passing grade. So, you have to go back and practice doing the calculations as well, okay? And also we will have some short questions and multiple choice questions. So some students spend a lot of time looking through the note to find exactly the answer, right? Maybe that's why it took them so long and then they couldn't do the calculation. So my suggestion is do the calculation first. Do the questions you know next, you don't have to look up in the notes. And then finally, the questions you don't know, you can spend the time to look up the notes, right? Because if you start the test and you start looking up the notes for every question, you're not going to have time to look up the notes for every question, right? So you're going to end up with the bad time management. What about the duration? What? What about the duration? The duration of the test? Yes, it's a two-hour class on Friday, so it will be about an hour and 20 minutes. Okay? So, let's start the review. Yes? Yes, you can also use the internet to look up the answers. It's an open book exam. Open book means you can look up the answers. Okay? Well, you have to watch your time management. If you look, if you look for every answer, you're not going to have time. You should know some of the answers without looking, right? At least some of them. Okay? <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to do a quiz. 
So, let's start the quiz. So this is the first question. So just calculate the quiz with your partner or your group together. So review the quiz. You have a relative who has savings of $100,000. And now they are going to retire. Assuming they want to make... Okay, I'm going to put this is on the geisha pad so you don't need to take any pictures. Right? Assuming she wishes to make... So listen please. Does anybody have any other question? No? So assuming she wishes to make equal annual withdrawals from these savings, how much will each annual withdrawal amount to? So the hard part of this question is finding out what do we want to know? What are we looking for? Annual withdrawal, right? How much will each annual withdrawal amount to? What's another word for annual withdrawal? Annuity. Okay, so we want to find an annuity. Okay, what do we know? So first thing we want to see in the question, what do we need to find? We need to find an annuity. Does everybody understand this? Annual withdrawal? Do you understand that? Is that an annuity? Annual deposit, annual withdrawal. Okay. What do we know? Is this a future value or a present value? Okay. What? So we need to find the annuity given present value. Okay. So go back in your notes and find the equation, which is find annuity given present value. Do you understand given? The equation is in your notes like this. Annuity given present value. Okay, given means we know. Annuity when we know present value. Annuity when we know present value. Okay? That's what that means. We know the present value, we want to find the annuity. Okay? So go back in your notes, find that equation, and try the calculation now. Pretend it's the exam and you have to answer this question. In this case, you can talk to your partner. They can explain if you don't know, okay? It's an annual withdrawal. Annual withdrawal per year. Yeah. 
right? So there's a time value of money. You should have this equation. What's the number of this equation, right? Okay. Yes? We have one answer here, eight, around eight thousand dollars. Do what other people find that answer? Eight thousand dollars. Yes. So let's put in the numbers. So what do we have here? Present value, right? One hundred. Let's say we just say for thousands. One hundred. Right. What's next? Over. 0 0.05, the interest rate. Okay? What's here? The power up. What's on the bottom line? 1 minus. One minus. One over one point zero five to the power of twenty, okay? One plus zero zero five to the power of twenty. So we just go we don't have to remember this equation, right? We check in our notes and we put it down. So when we do this, we're, we're going to have 100 times 0 0.05 over, what's on the bottom line? 1 minus what? 0 0.375. 7, 7. Equals 100 times 0 0.05 over. 0 0.627. What? 623. So what's 100 times what? 8,000. So the answer is going to be 8,000 and 35. 25. Okay. Do you have any questions about that calculation? Does, when you finish your calculation, you should see if it sounds right. Okay? Does this sound right? It does, right? I have 100,000. I have 5% interest a year. Over 20 years, multiply this by 20, it's going to be 160,000. So that will allow for the interest over 20 years. So it sounds right. If this number was 200,000, I know that's wrong. I can't have a yearly amount of 200,000. It just sounds wrong, okay? So just check your answer. Does it sound right or sound wrong? Okay. <coughs> Next question. Okay. 
Okay, so try this question we already saw in the exercise, right? Like review, it's a review. <coughs> Was question four that some people couldn't do in the exercises? So who can tell me what equation are we going to use? What equation are we going to use? What do we know? What's this? What's this? Future value, right? In 10 years, we're going to get back $1,000. It's a 10-year bond for $1,000, means in 10 years, they're going to pay us $1,000, okay? What's this? Present value. What do we need to know? So what equation are we going to use? Simple present value or simple future value. Either of those two are okay, right? Solve for or. Find the or. So use your simple present value or simple future value equation to find out R. more practice exercise for the time value of money, under time value of money. So then let's uh, finish there for today, we can solve this question tomorrow. Okay? So I'll see you on the next uh, Wednesday, we'll continue with the review. Have a nice weekend.